Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to talk about Rust-based Vertio backends for hypervisor exhaustive solutions today. Uh, there is a growing trend in the current market to um, implement virtualization for market husband than, other than the traditional server environment. The server environment is then uniform in nature, but as we move towards uh, richer ecosystems of automotive, mobile, medical, and IoT, uh, way richer uh, ecosystems, organizations, and uh, more device abstractions are required. At Linaro, we started Project Stratos with the aim to make Vertio as a standard interface between hypervisors, freeing mobile, automotive, and all these different platforms to migrate from one uh, hypervisor to another one without the need of implementing the backends again. Uh, myself, Viresh Kumar, I have work as a senior kernel engineer at Linaro. I co-maintain QFrameworks in the Linux kernel. You have already met Alex, Alex Benny. He is a senior virtualization engineer at Linaro, and he leads the project Stratos. We'll quickly go through uh, by the introduction to Vert, IO, vhost, and vhost user, how they have evolved over the years, and then we'll go to what we have been doing at Linaro uh, in Project Stratos and what we are looking to do going forward. So Vertio was designed as a standard open interface for the virtual machines to offload their data path processing to the host kernel or to the host kernel or the host user space uh, instead of the guest VM. Uh, Vertio defines two entities, one at the host and other at the, uh, the guest. The entity at the host is responsible to share its vert queues and the entity is called as Vertio device. It basically emulates the device, the virtual device. Uh, the entity running at the guest, it is known as Vertio driver. It shares its vert queues, which are then uh, accessed by the host device. There are various transports which are already uh, implemented for Vertio, like PCI, MMIO, channel IO. Though a point to note here is that the higher level device abstractions, uh, like a block device, they are very much independent of the underlying transport mechanism. This slide shows the basic sequence of events that take place uh, for a vertical transfer from the guest to the host. On the right side, you can see the guest VM. On the left, you can see the host VM. The host VM is the one which has hosted the guest VM. So they are on side by side. Uh, a normal write operation, a write syscall to FD eventually reaches to the vertio block driver on the guest side here in the red block. Uh, this driver is responsible to prepare the data packets, put them into the BERT queue, and send a kick to the host kernel. Uh, when the kick is sent, the VM exits at this point of time, and the control reaches to the host kernel. Uh, in this particular case, the, the backend, the vhost user daemon, is implemented in a user space. And it passes the con so the host kernel passes the control to the VMM running in user space, and the backend, uh, it reads the event FT to get the notification. It uh, processes the word queue, reads the, uh, the data packets, and if required, programs the hardware, the block, uh, via the uh, write command, and it already has mapped the device. Uh, once it is done, it, uh, it may update the status on the word queue and then send a call back to the guest VM. The, uh, one important thing to note here is that uh, Vertio is an asynchronous protocol, so the guest doesn't need to uh, wait indefinitely for the host to complete this operation. It can go on and a response will be sent at a later point of time. While at it, let's also see how it happens in case of Zen. In case of Zen, the VMM is not responsible for doing all this. The VMM is only uh, there to create and destroy the guest. Uh, uh, rather, in this case, the backend implements a Zen-specific thing, which is Zen IOX server, which, which enables the backend to get events and information from the guest kernel. And this is the this is the layer which is responsible for processing the word queues. Vhost is a protocol to offload data path processing to the kernel from the guest VM. The processing, of course, in this case happens in the guest kernel. And for the VMM to share the word queues to the host kernel, the interface is provided via, the control path is provided via the IOCTLs. Uh, this slide is pretty much same on the guest side. On the host side, the main difference is that the processing happens within the kernel. So when the guest exits, does a VM exit, at that point of time, the host kernel comes up and it, uh, the adapter there, it goes and uh, processes the word queue, all the data in, from it, and then eventually sends the, returns back to the guest. Uh, here, the VM, if you see here, the VMM, uh, it implements the vhost IOCTL 
uh, for the for VM to VMM to configure the various word queue information to the kernel driver. VHost user uh, protocol it complements the VHost protocol in a sense that the the control plane is implemented via Linux domain sockets. Uh, the main purpose of VHost user is to implement the backend, the VHost user daemon, in the user space instead of kernel. Uh, <clears throat> the VHost user protocol defines two major entities. One is front end and one is back end. Front end is the entity which shares the word queues. It, you can, it, it looks like uh, the word IO driver in, in a sense, but it is really the VMM, in, like QM in our case, uh, which shares its word queue. And back end is the entity which consumes the word queues. This shows the uh, vhost user uh, path. So it is very much similar to how it looks in case of vhost. The major difference is that uh, the standalone user space device emulation daemon is sitting in the user space, which talks to the VMM over the vhost user protocol uh, using a Unix socket domain, and it processes the word queues from the guest. Um, at, as I said earlier, Linaro's project Stratos was started with the aim to make Vertio the standard interface, uh, allowing all these platforms like IoT and mobile to run to make the backends portable between hypervisors. Right now, um, QEMU has some of the VHOS user uh, backends implemented within it, which can run independently of QEMU, but they share a lot of code with QEMU right now, and they are not really independent in that manner. So, and we have been looking to make these backends hypervisor agnostic. So the same backend which runs on QEMU with KVM can also run on Zen and on some other hypervisor like cloud hypervisor as well. Uh, we have done a lot of work in around one and a half years uh, until now with just a bunch of engineers. We have worked in all different categories like, so we started with uh, what are specifications. We wrote a few of our own, uh, reviewed a few. Um, sent improvement patches for a few of them to the water specification. We also implemented kernel drivers, reviewed some of them. The main thing that we have done is implemented the vhost daemons in user space, which are supposed to be hypervisor agnostic. Uh, while, while doing so, we implemented the backend for GPIO and chose libgpid to be the intermediate layer, and we were required to add Rust support for libgpid as well, which was very time consuming. In the process, because we wanted to emulate the device on QEMU and Zen, we did develop some patches there as well. We, we tried to upstream first. We are upstreaming everything that we have. There is nothing which is closed source as of now. So uh, Rust. Rust is a new language which is making its way into the embedded domain nowadays. Uh, we will likely see it into the Linux kernel very, very soon. Uh, initially, we developed everything based off C, and we thought maybe it's a good time to try Rust. Rust is a language which guarantees performance, safety, and concurrency. Uh, it, it is of very high importance in our case because we have to handle untrusted guest data at the host side, and the guarantees that Rust provides are really, really significant in our case. And then Rust is cool. Everybody talks about it nowadays, so we thought maybe we'll give it a shot. Rust VMM is a, is a framework. It's, it's hosted in GitHub normally. It's a framework for building VMMs. For example, uh, there will be a, car, a crate. Crate is like a Git repository, you can say, but it is still different. So it's, there's a crate, a module for vhost. There will be a module for vhost backend, vhost frontend. These are all different modules which, when combined together, they, they make the real thing. So there are many hypervisors which are already using and sharing these modules, like Cross VM, Firecracker, Cloud Hypervisor, which are heavily using these Rust VM components. So whatever we have been developing, we are trying to uh, upstream into the Rust VM project because that is the most sensible project where we can upstream all this stuff to. Uh, when we started, the Rust VM project did not have any specific crate where we can upstream the device implementations, the device emulations. So we created a vhost device crate for our own. It is currently maintained by Linaro employees, Alex, me, Matthew Poirier. He is not here today. And we have already upstreamed quite of them, like GPIO, I2C, random number generator, while there are some others which are still in progress. RPMB and SCSI uh, and VSOC. There are pull requests which are there for implementing their Rust support. 
while SCMI and video, they are uh, C-based right now, and we are looking to migrate them to uh, Rust as well. One of the common thing here is that the current implementation is very much Linux environment specific, like we, um, we access the device from the dev interface in SysFS in the kernel, uh, but there are some which, which are bare metal like uh, SCMI, it is a bare metal implementation, but right now in C. Uh, when we, uh, so initially we developed everything with QEMU because it was easy, fast, we, could, we can just do it on our machines. Uh, once we had a couple of backends in place, we thought, what can we do now? Uh, because we are claiming that it, they are going to be hypervisor agnostic, but we have only tested them with one, one of the hypervisor, KVM, along with QEMU. Uh, we thought, which is the hypervisor which makes more sense to go to? And Zen was one of the one of the choices we had because it's a type one hypervisor. It fits very well, very well with the ARM's model of hypervisors, uh, and then it has good upstream support. There is a good community around it, so we moved to Zen. Uh, when we moved to Zen, the problem was that a lot of uh, stuff was not there, like we host we host user protocol. These were not implemented for Zen. Uh, all that we could find was. Uh, there's a disk uh, device uh, emulation which was written in C uh, for Zen, where they have implemented they have implemented the way they can pa uh, pass the word I/O packets, the word queues, and all. But the vhost user was the main missing thing, which was there already in QEMU when we started. So uh, now we have a working setup where we can test the existing uh, backends unmodified with Zen, and we have already proven that the backends are really hypervisor agnostic, and there's a lot of effort right now to stream a lot of Zen bits into Rust VMM and into Zen as well. Uh, if you see this slide, yeah. so this is, this is the main component that we have added. There are three things here. Uh, we'll come across that. These are the three entities which, uh, which are basically worked on by us in the Zen side to make, uh, to support vhost user and test the existing backend. The existing vhost user daemon is this one. It hasn't changed since QEMU. This is the new part which we have to do for Zen. There are three main components here. The first one is ZenSys. It is developed by Matthew Poirier. Uh, this basically uh, provides support for Zen hypercalls via IOCTLs and bare metal. Uh, then, then we have vhost user master. The vhost user master uh, crate uh, was, the basic purpose of the crate is to provide the vhost user front-end side of the development. The Rust VMM community already had the back-end side of implementation, and we could use it earlier for the back-ends, but the front-end side they did not have. Uh, luckily, in our case, uh, the cloud hypervisor did implement the vhost user master site, and we were able to fetch a lot of stuff from there, add some things out on the top of it, and make the vhost user master crate. Now, this crate is not Zen-specific. It is very much hypervisor agnostic. Anybody who wants to implement uh, vhost user front-end can use it. QEMU can use it for, that's it, if they want to use a Rust-based implementation. Zen vhost master is a vhost user master implementation specifically for Zen, which, which has you know, all the sequence of events you need to do for mapping the memory, the Zen IORX server thing, and it uses vhost master side as well, vhost user master uh, create as well. It is based on EPAM's Vertio disk implementation, as I said earlier, which was done in C, but it did not have any vhost user protocol implementation at all. When we moved to Zen, uh, we wanted the backend to be really hypervisor agnostic. They still are, uh, but there are challenges which we have faced. Um, in case of KVM, uh, the guest memory is mapped via dev SHM. Uh, it, they, these are user space pages, and in, but in case of Zen, when we moved there, so uh, with dev system, the main benefit is that uh, we can follow the standard Linux kernel uh, way of mapping the pages. We can just do mmap and everything will be fine. We will have the guest uh, memory available to the, to the host kernel, to the backend, and it works fine. And that is how the Rust VMM projects are aligned. They just issue, do mmap and they expect it to work. But in case of Zen, uh, the Zen community couldn't use the user space pages. They had to move to kernel space pages because the kernel sometimes sets the page table entries to invalid state, and if Zen comes and tries to access the page at that particular time, they get a fault. And because of that, they couldn't use uh, user space pages, but they have to move to kernel pages. 
Uh, for implementing that, uh, Zen supports a lot of hypercalls, not just MF. And to have a uniform, uniform way of doing all the hypercalls, they, the way they implemented is that for MF, you have to do MF first, which will set some flags and all. But eventually, you have to issue an IOCTL. And this is where our system broke, broke because we thought that MF should be just enough. And we did not, do not want to implement something which, uh, which doesn't work well with the Linux syscall way. So we expected MF to be, to be robust enough and it should just work, but it does not. For now, we have hacked the kernel uh, for Zen in driver's Zen pre CMD file. Uh, we have hacked it in a way that everything which is done by IOCTL for MF is done in MF itself. It works right now for us, but it is not a solution we can upstream, and we still need to find a solution for this. Uh, what's next? So we have been looking to upstream uh, vhost user master crate, which we picked from Cloud Hypervisor, and then vhost master, uh, which we have implemented ourselves. Uh, we already have few pull requests to the Rust VMM community in GitHub to get things started, start merging these things bit by bit. Um, we need a standard MAP interface, as we discussed earlier. We, need, uh, we think that there's opportunity to improve the performance by reducing the number of contexts which, which, which are required for IRQ, FD, and event FD from the guest to the backend. And then there is space for guest memory space privatization. Uh, we'll cover them one by one. So this is the previous slide. Uh, this shows indirect IRQ, FD, event FD. So when the control passes from guest VM, VM VM to the host kernel. Eventually, it reaches to Zen vhost master here, uh, which, uh, which is implemented via uh, IOREC, Zen IOREC. When the event reaches here, that some data is present in the word queue. Uh, we send the event FD from here. It again goes into the kernel, come back to the back end. So we wake up the user space just to wake up another thread. And there is an unnecessary context switch to kernel and then to user space, which, which you want to avoid. What we think is, if, if the kernel can somehow handle this uh, interrupt from the VM and straight away pass it on to backend, it will be great. We do not have a solution for it right now, but I think Paolo mentioned something this morning regarding in-kernel event delivery. That, that can be very interesting for us. And then comes guest memory space privatization. So in the current setup, uh, the backend can see the entire guest space which is, of course, not, not ideal because we may want the guest VM to be secure and it doesn't want to show its entire user space, its, its entire space. Uh, the word queues in the guest VM are, VM are always mapped in the host side, so the, the host can all, always see the word queue area, but the data buffers which are, which are filled by the guest, uh, they are, that is the tricky part. So there are three solutions how we can map that. Uh, the first one is per request map. This is something which Zen community has already agreed to to some level and merged some of it in the Linux kernel. It is known as uh, Zen Grant or IOMMU based solution. The problem here is that uh, potentially there can be multiple buffers for each what I request. And then we'll be required to do a map for all these buffers on the go for every single request. And we worry that it will be too slow uh, and it is really not efficient. But this is already merged and yeah, we'll see. The other solution that we can think of is a carved out region where a fixed region is set up uh, between guest and host where all this buffer will be copied, but then it will not be zero copy, it will be fast, but it will have its own problems. And the last one, which was again uh, suggested from Linaro by Arndt Bergman, is fat word queues. The idea here is that the, since the word queue memory is always mapped, why not put the data right into the word queue? But the problem here is that if the data is small, yes, it can make sense, but the word queue memory is not infinite, it is still finite. And we cannot put really big chunks of data into that. So there are a couple of solutions here, but we do not really know what, what's the right solution to go forward with it. Uh, that's pretty much it. You can join us at Project, Project Stratos webpage. Uh, we have a dedicated mailing list where we discuss all, all the uh, things that are going on. We have fortnightly Stratos meeting and Rust VM meetings as well. Uh, where you can join and discuss if you would like. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, me and Alex are here. Um, yep. Yeah, <laughs>
do we have to, time to do questions now, or are you? Yes. Yeah. So, any questions? Obviously not. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah. right. so if, you, if you have any questions come to you, just grab us uh, during the rest of the forum and we'll happily right. answer them. Thank you. Oh, sure. What's your general experience of switching over to Rust? Sorry, what was that? So, so the question was what our general experience of switching over from Rust to C. So, from C to Rust. C, C to Rust, sorry. Yeah, n neither of us had done any uh, Rust before, so it was a, a, a fairly steep learning curve. Uh, I tried to dabble with Rust before a couple of times and generally just got lost after I'd gone through the first, you know, Hello World examples. What really helped for me was actually going on a, a week-long intensive course where I could, you know, do Rust every day and get the, the, the model in my head. Yeah. How did you It has been quite... So, um, I think Alex started the Rust training first, while in my case, I did write a couple of backends and upstream them before I got a chance to do the training. But it's a fantastic language. Uh, I cannot really promise what they promise. Uh, they do guarantee that there are a lot of things which, the, like the performance will be as good as what you can see in C. I cannot confirm it because I have not tested it at a great length right now. But the language is fantastic. The kind of problems it solves for us, like, um, the races it avoids and all this is really, really good. And it's, it's an easy language to learn. It's not really difficult. Just a few things and that's it. Yeah, I, think, I think the main thing is getting your head around right. the, the, the Rust model. It's like pointers. So yeah. You have to understand pointers and then everything is fine. <laughs>